We want to bring our guest right away, as you mentioned, from up in the New Jersey area as well. He's a journalist, has uh, covered uh, sports and news for the Washington Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, and a brand new book out just came out not too long ago. It's called Billion Dollar Ball, A Journey Through Big Money Culture of College Football, and it's getting a lot of great press, and we're joined today by a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, Gilbert Gall from up in New Jersey. Gilbert, thanks for joining us. How are you tonight? Um, well, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, good to have you with us. And Adal, I'll let you start. Well, what got you started? What gave you the idea that this is the direction you wanted to go? Well, I did a series about uh, 16 years ago about the business of college sports when I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and that got me thinking in general about this. Uh, and over time, uh, I had suggested uh, doing a uh, doing a project just looking at what I like to call the economy of college football. In other words, just tracking all the money. And what got me interested in particular was there um, was the uh, explosion in the uh, scale of money in college football. It has um, it has just gone um, ballistic in the last 15 years, and that's because of the TV deals, the seat donations, the tickets, and all the corporate money that has flown into um, into uh, the elite university programs. So really, that's what got it going. There's a long backstory to how the book came about, but uh, I don't think your readers need to hear that. I had a chance to read through the book, and uh, it really is you know, fascinating when you look at the, like you said, the, the, the money behind it all. I mean, we hear the, the, the crazy coaches' salaries that are being paid, but uh, right. how uh, you know, college football really funds every other sport pretty much. I guess basketball might fund itself, but it really funds all the yeah. other sports at the university, doesn't it? Well, it does at the elite schools. When I say elite, I mean the 65 schools and the five uh, so-called power conferences or super conferences. Uh, it acts as a kind of cross subsidy for uh, the Olympic sports or the poor sports because of the way the business model works, which is that all the money comes from football, basically. I mean, some money comes from basketball, but the majority of the money, say upwards of 70% at the major football programs, is uh, in one way directly or indirectly coming from football, and it, and it does help to fund them. So that's the positive thing. Uh, the question you have to ask is, though, what comes with that? You know, <laughs> it, what else happens as a result of this business model? All the distortions that occur, everything from you know your your primary brand being known as a football school to the out of control spending, the lack of any institutional controls over the spending, the academic fraud that of, often comes with this, um, the uh, the fact that your uh, coach, your head football coach, is is likely to be paid somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 times the college president and be the highest paid public employee. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of other issues. Well, I think we could use Penn State as a perfect example. Uh, you know, I remember back when Penn State was, was a relatively small university in terms of uh, their football program, but it grew and grew and grew. And, of course, Joe Paterno, who I did a lot of work with Joe over the years, uh, having been with Temple and, and uh, basketball and football. And uh, Joe broke, built that program to the point where uh, it was just unbelievable. He was building, you know, libraries and, and everything else out of his own money. Well, yeah. I mean, look, Paterno is a very interesting and, and, and somewhat complex question. <laughs> um, I mean, clearly he made enough money that he and his wife could donate money to help fund part of the library up there. So that's that's great. He also... Uh, helped to build this um, this incredible football program, or I should say that they built an incredible football program around him. Correct. Uh, it's also interesting, though, that um, a couple of things. I mean, one is Penn State's now talking about either renovating its 106,000-seat um, stadium or building, possibly even building a new stadium. This is all within the last week or two. Um, that this has come out, and that's that's a fascinating um, thing because you have to ask yourselves, well, why are they doing it? You know, why do they need to do it? And the answer is they need to do it probably because of money um, from a combination of the fallout of the Sandusky um, scandal to, you know, and, and losing seats to the economics of their program not working quite as well as they did, say, 10 years ago before all this happened, um, you know, they need to monetize their stadium a little bit more, which probably means higher seat donations for the pr pr uh, premium seats, probably might mean more luxury boxes or higher um, higher fees for those luxury boxes and possibly even higher, higher ticket prices downstream. And it's also interesting, you know, you think about it, Paterno allegedly or reportedly was only paid a million dollars at his peak. 
And um, they went out and hired James Franklin from Vanderbilt, who I think had three years head coaching experience at the time, but a long time, a great reputation as an assistant. But, you know, what did they pay him? They paid him $4.3 million. That, as much as anything, told me that the football culture at Penn State was still demanding that they continue to compete at the very elite level. Uh, no question about that. And, and uh, Joe uh, had time and time again, in fact, uh, you're from the Cherry Hill area, so you know that he had a very strong opportunity to go to the Philadelphia Eagles years ago, but he had other choices as well. And uh, But he said it was in his uh, his best interest to stay at the University of Pennsylvania, or at uh, Penn State University, and that, that's exactly what he did. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know why. <clears throat> I don't know why he turned down the Jets and he turned down the Eagles and, and possibly even turned down some other ones. I mean, I don't think he was poor by any stretch of the imagination. No. Um, I, I think he did quite fine, and I know that he probably had lots of other outside deals that in one way or another were tied to uh, tied to football. Uh, you know, why he turned down those other things, it was probably he was just really comfortable, and I think he, he truly enjoyed being at Penn State, and, you know, he did a great job. Um, you know, I would argue that he changed a little bit in the last decade that he was there. Maybe he overstayed, um, you know, his time, but uh, he certainly isn't the first coach to have done that. You talk, Doug? you talk in the book, uh, and by the name of the book again is a billion dollar ball. Talking to Gilbert Gall, but you talk in the book about uh, 120 schools and Division One football and the and the super conferences that pretty much control all the money. I think we see an example down here, Gilbert and Don. You might agree with this uh, with. Uh, USF uh, in Tampa, yep. uh, a school that uh, has had football about 10 or 12 years, but they're, they're barely drawing 20, 25,000 people at Tampa Stadium, and uh, there's one of the schools there that probably loses money, right, playing football. Well, I can't imagine they're making money playing football. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember. They used to be in the old Big East, right? Right. Now, uh, what conference are they in well, now? Are they uh, in that? That All-American or whatever it's called, American yeah, Conference? I, yeah. Sure. All right. So, I mean, that conference is not getting uh, – it doesn't have a big television contract, so it can't be getting much money from from TV. Um, you know, a number of Florida schools, uh, the two exceptions, major exceptions, would be the uh, University of Florida and Florida State. But these other schools have a lot of trouble getting people to come to the games, and it could be as simple as the weather's too nice. You know, it's easier to go to the beach than it is to go sit on a hard stadium seat for two hours, especially if your team's struggling. Now, um, South Florida had had a really good team there for a couple of years, but it seems to have slipped backward. Um, you know, across on the other side, uh, you have Florida Atlantic, which I, I, I spent a little bit of time getting familiar with. And, you know, that's another example of a school that's trying to – play at the highest level, uh, and yet, you know, uh, competitively, it just hasn't succeeded. Um, it's been struggling. Um, it loses a lot of money. They went ahead and built a $70 million stadium anyway that most of the time seems to be half empty. Um, and this is a common theme. So if you're in the five super conferences, yeah, you're probably getting rich playing football. If you're one of these other 60 schools playing in one of these other conferences, you're, you're probably losing lots of money. Um, or at the very best, working even. You have trouble getting folks to come to your games. You have trouble getting television. You can't charge people these seat donations for premium seats. So it's, you know, it's not, not much of a proposition. But, you know, the president still believe that somehow that they will magically get to this higher level at some point in time and cash in. Um, it's really magical thinking on their parts because it's <laughs> not going to happen. Well, Gilbert, uh, Doug has a little bit of a foot up on me. I have not had an opportunity to read the book as yet. He has. Uh, did you delve in at all to Nike and what they're doing with uh, the college athletics? In fact, what they're doing in, in athletics altogether? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, the way I tell that story is, is really by spending a lot of time uh, at the University of Oregon in telling the story of the rise of Oregon football and you know, particularly the facilities there and the distortions, the amount of money that they spend on the players as opposed to the amount of money they're spending on their, their best and smartest students at the Honors College at Oregon. So, uh, yeah, I mean, some people call Oregon the University of Nike out there, and uh, its, presence, its presence is everywhere, even on trash cans. You see the, you know, the ubiquitous swoosh. Um, uh, Phil Knight has... Um, you know, he's given $42 million to build an academic support center for the athletes. And when we say athletes, we're really talking about mostly football players and basketball players because they tend to be, academically, they tend to be the problem, um, the problem sports. 
the other uh, Olympic sport athletes tend to be a little bit better generally. Um, they've, uh, Phil has given another $70 million to build a football performance center um, in both of these facilities. I've visited both, and they're just extraordinarily lavish. They look like uh, museums of art. They have um, just uh, gaslit fire uh, places in the downstairs lobby at the Academic Support Center. Um, they have a they have a, a three story mural of Albert Einstein of all people at the Academic <laughs> Support Center. Um, it's it's just you know our neighbor up here. Albert was Albert was our neighbor here in Princeton. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They have biometric keypads that, um, um, for the athletes to get in and out of the football performance center. They they used Italian marble in the in the showers for the football players. I mean, it, it spared no money whatsoever. <laughs> Um, and it's just amazing. I mean, Oregon, Oregon's gone from a relatively modest athletic department um, about a decade ago to now being one of the wealthiest and biggest athletic departments in the country, with certainly the best facilities in the country. And it's all about recruits, bringing in those well, players. Well, Doug, you know as well as I do, and Doug and I are, I, I'm a great uh, New York Post reader and, and Phil Mushnick. And Phil, of course, gets on at least every every other <laughs> that he writes talks about Nike and the fact that they're changing the, the school colors. Everything now has to be black. If you're even Oregon has changed their school colors at times now. Oh well, they absolutely do. I mean, they when I was out there um, during the tour, the guy who was giving me the tour um, don't hold me to this number, but I want to say that they had an algorithm in which they could do a hundred different color combinations with the football team. <laughs> and on, on Saturdays, some Saturdays, the players don't even know what color they're going to be wearing until they show right. up in the locker room. It's decided by the by the Nike guys. Um, you know, I don't think that's particularly evil, but I think it shows. I think it shows the influence of Nike at at Oregon. And you know what? You're absolutely right about black. Black is the new cool color at Oregon. Everything is black. I mean, they the uh, the, the football performance that are is uh, is uh, made out of uh, this uh, basil rock in a obsidian black, and the locals refer to it as the Death Star from uh, the old Star Wars movie. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I, I was at Temple for a long period of time, and John Cheney was one of the first, and uh, when they came in, uh, Temple's are <laughs> from maroon and white to black uniforms and that's, uh, in their basketball program, and it, it's carried out through all the universities, as I say. Phil, Phil Mustick, as Doug knows well, writes about it. Uh, no matter what school you go to, if they have Nike, they're, they're going to wear black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. It, it's all about branding. You got another great chapter in the book, and it really kind of epitomizes uh, kind of what you're talking about—the the big money that, that they can throw around to coaches. And in the case of Charlie Weiss, who uh, I think twenty-three million dollars is the number you have being paid not to coach, right? Notre Dame and the University of Kansas. Yeah, so he was hired at, at, at ND, I think it was, what, 2004 wow. when they brought him in, and, and he had a six-year contract. Six games into the first season, they almost beat USC in that famous game where I think it was Reggie Bush who pushed the quarterback across, probably Sanchez, across the goal line. <laughs> and um, and the, uh, the Notre Dame athletic director, they, they tore up Charlie's contract the day after that, or, or shortly after that anyway, and it gave him a new contract for 10 years. So they extended it out to 10 years and guaranteed him all this money. And then, as uh, happens often in cases like this, you know, a few years later it went south and the team went from being good to, to really struggling. And, they, and, and he lost some very embarrassing games to teams they never should have lost to, if, you, if you're a Notre Dame fan anyway. Lesser teams like Connecticut, of all places. Right. And, and he gets fired, and he's owed all this money. And and I think it's um, at Notre Dame, it, I, I did a calculation that it came out. I used a lower, more conservative calculation. It came out to about $17 million that they owed him. And then what happens is he, he ends up being hired at Kansas about two years later. And Kansas isn't much of a football That, that made no sense, too, that hire. I mean, that, that, that really... <laughs> Puzzled well, me. you know, you got to talk to the athletic director, um, and and you know the, he was he was buying a brand name. I mean, I, I don't doubt that Charlie Charlie Weiss is a good coach at all. It's just that it didn't work out for him in college. No. And at Kansas, you know, it went south there after two years, and they owed him like two and a half years on a on a five year deal. 
that was worth about 6.5 million or 5.5 million. And so when he added it all up, it comes to roughly about 23 million dollars. He's he's being paid in buyouts, not the coach. Well, Charlie's uh, right in our area here. In fact, I at the restaurant about two blocks from me. Uh, my neighbor next door owns it, and uh, Charlie uh, he gave them great publicity. Rods and Seagert, and every time he did a story, he talk well, about he's Frank. Jersey, he's a Jersey guy, and uh, oh yeah, you know, I saw him. Know. I saw him a couple of weeks ago at the bar at the at, right at Rods. I, yeah, uh, he's a, he's as colorful and and uh, yeah. lovable as ever, and and. Sure. <laughs> I'll okay, tell you, why wouldn't he be? <laughs> absolutely, you're he's, he's absolutely right. He'd buy a round right. of drinks with that with that buyout. <laughs> you're absolutely right. But that's the way that's the way these coaches go. When even well, Saban, good. when he finally even Saban, when he finally re- jumps out of Alabama, they're going to owe him more money than the school's worth. Oh, you know what? <laughs> and Nick's doing quite well as it is. He's getting seven point one million dollars now, <laughs> and, and you know he he is not hurting for for money and. And you know he's he's investing wisely in real estate, and, and he, he's starting a Mercedes-Benz dealership. I, I mean, he's clearly clearly a money guy. And you know, Alabama, when you talk to them about it, you know they they feel like they're not embarrassed by this at all. They think it's completely normal to pay absolutely seven point one million. Absolutely. Doug? Yeah. Well, what are you making? And Don, you can jump in. It's your alma mater, but uh, what, what about Texas uh, with, the, with the Charlie Strong thing? I mean, uh, you seem to have got a bit of wow. a a bit of a vote of confidence today, if you believe that. But uh, that, those people down in don't, Texas don't put up with that much. Do not, do not believe that. He I don't will believe be it. Gone before the season's <laughs> over, gave up another well, I fifty. I don't know about that, but they certainly don't have any patience. I mean, and and, and you know, I, I will tell you that the president gave Mac Brown a vote of confidence too. Uh, That's right. You know, shortly before he ends up. You know, well, they're going to say he wasn't fired, but he he obviously left. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, no, Texas is an interesting story because you know, biggest athletic department in the country. You know, fabulous money, all driven by football. Um, I interviewed DeLos Dodds, the uh, former athletic director, and when he went there in '81, football was bringing in 2.1 million dollars. When he left, it was up to about 120 million dollars in wow. 2013. It's just extraordinary. And, you know, now this is all threatened because the program, and, and this started in the last few years of, of when Brown was there, you know, they, it's begun to go south. And the problem for them is they're not recruiting the way they once could. Correct. It used to be if you were a great football player, you went to Texas. That was where you went. But now you've got Texas A&M, you've got TCU, you've got Baylor just up an hour and a half up the road, I-35. You know, you've got Houston. I mean, you've got all these other schools that suddenly are quite hot and good. And the kids are now saying, huh, I don't have to go to Texas. You know, I can go to Baylor and we'll chuck it around 60 times a game, you know. and uh, Or I can go up to TCU and we'll chuck it around 80 times a, a game. Well, that's the, uh, that's the old Southwest Conference. When I was there, we played the right. Southwest Conference. And the right. schools that you mentioned, with the exception of Houston, Houston didn't come in until later on. But all the schools that you mentioned were, uh, along with SMU, unfortunately, SMU right. is now having more trouble with Larry Brown. They, they, got, <laughs> they got knocked out with the football program, finally got it back. Now they're having the same problems with the basketball program. Well, you know, the old story, if, if you can win games, they will hire you, and they will look they will look past whatever problems you have or have had in the past, and that's just the way it works. Um but you know, I, I just you know, I, I I'm curious about Texas and how long Charlie Strong will will hold on. You know, I, I'm guessing they give him at least this year. But if they end up losing a couple more embarrassing games, I would not be surprised to see him fired at the end of the year. I mean, they're, well, they're that desperate and serious. Yeah, about I get an email every day from the athletic department, and it doesn't it doesn't look to me like he's going to last too long. <laughs> well, he may not. He may not. Um, you know, I, you know. Again, I guess I wouldn't be terribly surprised if, if they let him go before the end of the season. But, gosh, uh, I don't know. You know, you got to give a guy a chance at least, and you know, they're not giving him much of a chance. Woo! You know, you gave up another fifty on Saturday. Yeah, you, you, What can you do? I mean, you, you got to be able to recruit better than that. <laughs> well, the name the name of the book is a billion dollar ball and uh, a journey through the big money culture of college football. We've been talking with uh, Gilbert Gall. 
uh, tonight on the show. And, Gil, really appreciate you taking the time to, to be with us. It's really a, a great book for any college football fan. You really get an insight into kind of the, the numbers and all that, what's going on behind the scenes. And it, it just well, P- Penguin Random House, right? That's who publishes, so they can get it there. And I yep. guess all the bookstores have it, right? They do. They do. Uh, it's gotten great reviews. And, and it's, um, you know, there's a lot of good stories in the book. So if you're a fan of college football, um, I think you would enjoy it. Gilbert, right. your next story ought to be, or your next book ought to be, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Daily News and what happened uh, to the bullets. Uh, you're, break, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> breaking my heart. I, I was there during the heyday of the Inquirer with Gene Roberts, and, and, and now, you know, to see what it is today is, is just heartbreaking. Well, Frank Dolson was my, one of my best friends, and uh, yeah. lost him a few years ago to cancer, but uh, uh, you're right. It, uh, it was one of the, the Inquirer was one of the great papers, and uh, uh, Daily News in its, own, in its own right was a good paper. And, and, oh, absolutely. Uh, but the Bulletin... Everybody in Philly reads the bulletin, but uh, the bulletin yeah. didn't make it. Uh, they were the, one of the first ones to go. They were. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you on with us, and uh, maybe we'll run into it at a ballpark or two somewhere. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Gilbert. <laughs>